talk about some of the big issues facing animal agriculture and food animal production. And I think we have a really good, diverse, and, and uh, interesting panel. Uh, obviously, we just heard from Greg, and, and I, I made a few notes as I was preparing for this. I think it's so cool that you have this kind of father-son tandem and, and a fourth-generation farming operation. Uh, there are some real challenges to being multi-generational in agriculture and some big challenges in keeping a farm running for now uh, approaching the, the fourth quarter century, I guess, of existence. To Greg's left, your right, Bill Hoyt, General Manager and CEO of uh, Holly Ranch. Did I say that right? Holly Ranch, yeah. Uh, great operation, natural grass-fed lamb and beef, marketing to restaurants and uh, markets throughout Oregon. They're both Beef Quality Assurance and Food Alliance certified and always striving for sustainable environmental practices. And I've made a few notes of questions that we're going to pepper each of these uh, panelists with. And then on the end, finally, the bell at the ball, Dr. Carolyn Orr is the Executive Director of State Ag and Rural Leaders, a group formed in 2006 consisting of legislators from around the country who are involved in agriculture and rural issues in their state legislatures. Uh, Dr. Orr is also a PhD from Texas A&M University, studied uh, stress physiology there, and for 23 years, I believe, was chair of the agriculture program at Berea College in Kentucky. Uh, panelists, if I got your bios wrong, don't tell anyone because I worked very hard to uh, look this information up via Google. So <laughs> that's good journalism right there, folks. That's good journalism. If it's on the internet, it had to be true. Good. All right. First thing right off the bat that I want to talk about is, is buzzwords. Buzzwords in agriculture. And I'm going to throw, um, before I do that, I guess actually before we get to the hard questions, Greg, you're going to get skipped here since we just heard from you. Bill, I, I gave your bio. Um, tell, tell folks here a little bit about yourself, maybe one thing about you or the ranch that I didn't give in that thumbnail description. Well, I, I, uh, I don't need a microphone. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm fifth generation. Uh, my grandfather's grandfather came to Oregon in uh, 1852 uh, from Illinois over the Oregon Trail. Um, and, uh, and I am very blessed to be five generations in a row. Uh, we were signaled out as one in Oregon in, uh, when Oregon became, uh, celebrated its 150th anniversary in 2009. We went to the Senate chambers and were one of 19 farms and ranches in the state that were identified as being given the Sesquicentennial Award for 150 years in um, in continuous operation in the same family uh, on the same ground and and uh, but I, and the other thing is I, I, I think that um, I have a new a new mantra um, and that is renewal is good um, we we all have to be aware that Greg's right um, that there's proactive approaches to animal agriculture today are difficult to come by and and uh, but are absolutely essential in the in the uh, atmosphere in which we live so uh, i'm i'm uh, i'm just a humble cowboy and i'm i'm very very um, proud to be here amongst such an austere group and, and, and of course bill just a humble cowboy which is exactly what i want to be when i grow up so <laughs> bill <you're clears throat> dr orr uh, your opening comments well, first of all, I have to apologize. I pulled a muscle in my neck yesterday, so my lack of excitement is not any way related to my passion about this subject. <laughs> Those of you that know me know how passionate I am about this. Um, I also have kind of a unique background in that just about everything we've talked about, I do. I have done. I have raised sows outside in lots. I have raised sows on concrete with bedded. I have raised sows in slatted crates. I have raised sows in gestation crates. I have raised layers on the floor. I've raised turkeys outside. I've raised uh, right now we have, I've raised sheep, goats, and cattle, and everywhere from cow-calf operation to feedlot. Right now we have a cow-calf operation. Uh, we'll always probably have a cow-calf operation, even though my son wants nothing to do with it. And that's one of the things that everyone's talking about third and fourth generation. We don't have any first generation farmers out there, people. And we won't have first gener we won't have sixth and seventh generation farmers if we don't make sure that there's a way for my son to go into this and to want to go into this and to make a profit going into this. And so my, uh, as he said, I've worked with state legislators. We've actually started this organization in 2000. I know the House and Senate Act Chairs of every one of your states and work with them very closely. I also probably know the ranking majority, ranking minority leaders in the Agriculture and Environmental Committees. And we 
one. I do want to make sure I give them an action item before I leave today. Okay. Action item is very important. All right. So back to the, the big question. And let's talk about buzzwords. Uh, Bill, I noticed on, on your website, Greg, I noticed on your website three or four words that I flagged as, as buzzwords, marketing speak, if you will. Let's start with the N word, natural. What, what defines natural in food animal production and, and, and who says? Well, it's, it, in my world, um, natural is uh, just as you have spoken, it's a, it's a marketing tool because the, the consumer wants to know that somehow it's do, being done in a way that is not um, contrived in any way. And so natural being um, the way nature intended uh, for it to be, and uh, that's a matter uh, of, of debate in some circles, but, um, you know, we, we market natural grass, fin grass finished, and there, there's so many misnomers in the buzzwords, you know, I mean, you, ours, uh, people have discovered, the science says that there is a difference between a grain-fed animal and a, and a grass-finished animal in the, in the fat content having omega-3s versus omega-6. So that, that's a real thing that we can get to. Um, however, there are other scientists who will say that if you ate 500 pounds of one and 500 pounds of the other, the, the health uh, changes to you, to you over time would be relatively small. So the perception that uh, natural and something is happening in a natural way, um, you know, they, there are people say that feeding in a feedlot is not natural um, because, but you know, if I put a bunk out in the middle of my pasture and I put grain or, or, or pellets in that bunk, they come and feed there. They come and eat there. I mean, so what's not natural about that? Um, so what we're talking about, I mean, is a, is a marketing, um, you know, and, and what we're probably going to even more is the truth in marketing. So if I say, well, I'm natural, antibiotic, hormone-free, that's the other thing that goes along with natural. If, if I, if you had, we are, we, we are antibiotic and hormone-free in our, in, our, uh, in, in our production. Well, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, that means that if I am selling a piece of meat, I will certify that it has not, that animal never had any antibiotics in its life. Does that mean I don't use antibiotics? No, if I, if I get one sick, if you have a child that's sick and, 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 and it gets to a point where it needs to have some attention medically and, and the response is, is to give it antibiotics, the humane thing to do is to give that animal antibiotics. So, because they become healthier. Now, do we give prophylactic antibiotics so that they get it all the time? No. And if I do give antibiotics, what do I do with that animal? that animal gets, uh, gets identified in the herd and sold into the generic market. So Greg, that maybe leads to my, my follow-up question. So you as a producer, when you have uh, customers who are interested in natural, antibiotic-free, no hormones, insert whatever food trend happens to be, can, can you as a producer afford not to at least consider marketing via those buzzwords or those niche productive practices how, how does that how does the consumer and their desires play into your business decision making process so i mean so our company model is that we want to market a full line of, of products so that you know so that we can offer something to the widest range of consumers mm -hmm. Um, the word natural is not really a word that we've used in, in our marketing. Um, you know, we, we tend to be pretty specific on our cartons, whether it's a high omega egg, a cage-free egg, um, you know, organic eggs. You know, those words uh, really do mean something. It's a, it's a specific classification that requires a different management. Um, uh, you know, the, the term natural has been somewhat, I think, abused in marketing. Uh, you know, I, I, I've heard of companies, you know, throwing in a scoop of oats into a ton of feed and calling that natural. You know, <coughs> but they didn't change anything. 
-hmm. So, uh, you know, we don't, we, we just haven't gone down that road marketing-wise. You know, we, we have started using the term, though, and, and as, as I think about it, with uh, transition, when we're talking about colony housing, uh, freedom to express natural behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's really the first first time I've started using the word all that, yeah. all that often. Dr. Orr, maybe you can give some perspective then from a policy standpoint. If, if you have, and I'm thinking back in Ohio and Pennsylvania when legislatures and departments of agriculture were trying to deal with the, the hormone issue through uh, RBST, let's say, in the milk supply, there, that was a big contentious issue, how you deal with the impact, if you will, of marketing campaigns on what consumers think maybe should become mandated or policy. Let's clarify first that there is no nutritional difference, whether it's organic, natural, antibiotic free. There is no antibiotics in anything. There is no no hormone free. There is not hormone free meat because all, it all has hormones in it. There is no RBST in your milk when you drink it. It's not it, even if you did, it wouldn't do. It wouldn't have any impact on you. You could drink it straight. So the first thing is it is all marketing, and we've just been through the biggest marketing campaign in the world. You know, seven billion dollars of marketing. Um, so it is all marketing, and I don't mind marketing if that works for you, but don't put, I want to make sure that people don't put down other forms of production in an effort to sell their form of production. And I want everyone to be able to, and that's the important issue that we find legislators find. UEP came to our legislative meeting in January and almost got run out of the room, and they're a sponsor. Because legislators don't want to be able to be, to be told, they don't want their consumers or their producers, their companies, their dollar makers to be told how to raise their animals. They need to have the flexibility to raise the animals in what works best for them. They need to be able to market them in what works best for them as long as they don't put down somebody else's form of marketing. And so when products are sold as all natural being better than products that are not, I think organic animal production is inhumane because you can't deworm. You can't treat for, for illnesses. You can't use antibiotics. I don't think that's humane. If you have a dog that's sick, does that mean that dog can never run with the other dogs again? No, that means you sell the animal. So anyway, um, that all natural, it does not have a definition. Organic does have a de definition. The big fight right now is GMOs. Um, legislators just do not want their, and legislators are interested in rural communities, want those rural communities to thrive, and they can't thrive if people are limited in how they can produce their product. Bill. <laughs> Bill, since, since you're someone who markets, uh, I would say, to a very discerning audience through particularly dealing with the restaurants and, and some of those high-end markets, the, some of these kind of marketing words, I guess, are, are important to those folks. So how do you balance some of the, the issues Carolyn described with your need to sell a product at a profit? Well, I, I don't. I don't try to. Is when I, I, when I don't, I don't try to uh, make. I, we do what we do. Um, we have a program that I think is uh, it's very small compared to the to the large marketing. Uh, we're we're a, in for lamb, for instance, um, the largest wholesale lamb producer in in Oregon. For you know, roughly averages 200 lambs a week, um, and if, and we're very fortunate if we will do 10. Um, so our, our market is, um, we, we market more uh, more consistency. Um, the relationship is what is the most important for us. Our restaurateurs, we, we, we deal with, I think, some great restaurants that, that um, are, you know, have very discerning customers. I, I was telling Kathy earlier that I, I had a very great opportunity to have breakfast with three sh uh, chefs from the San Francisco Bay Area talking about the, the relationship between the producer and the restaurateur. And one of the things that, that I was very, very interested was that the, the one owner said, my customers know more about what they want than I do. And so they're telling me what they want me to serve them in my restaurant. And, and, and that, was, that was really telling to me. So the relationship between uh, the grower and, the, and the, the retailer, if you will, it is what makes our relationship great. We, we had our, one of our leading restaurants came to the ranch and, in June 
and we had a field day. And they brought their kids and, and, and moms and dads and families, and, and we, we spent the day cooking a five-course meal on the ranch and, and was very interested I was, that they, I did not promote this. They brought the, the, the Portland press with them. And, and uh, you know, that cemented relationships. And so they saw what we do and we, where we're growing. We're, we're, we're trying to get on the cutting edge of, of producing forages that will grow year round and that will, in our climate, and that will produce, give our animals a chance to grow and get fat on, on the forages that we produce year round so that we'll have a quality year round supply. And, and so the buzzwords are there and we use them because that's what we do. But I get asked, I speak all over the state and they ask me, well, what about Food Inc? Mm -hmm. And you hear about corporate farming and all this stuff, you know I mean? And I say to them, you know, one of the things that you don't want to do is to take shots at big food. I don't care what segment you're in. We have 300 plus million people in the United States today and, and, do, and, and so big food, it takes big food to produce food for a big country to eat or a large population. So, and doing it, if, you know, in farmer's markets is not gonna get it. Mm -hmm. And so I agree um, with Carolyn that, that you, you know, organic to me is, is, I mean, I give, I do what's necessary for the health of my animals. And if that means giving antibiotics, that's what I do. Now, when we say hormones, the, the, the growth stimulant hormones is what we're talking about. So hormones are present in, in, all, in all mammals. We have hormones, we produce them, our bodies produce them. But when we add hormones, I think, to, for growth stimulants, I, I, you know, we just don't do that. Now, it, it, I'm not gonna speculate or sit there and say that I'm a scientist that says this is gonna be better or worse for you to eat. I'm just gonna say this is not what we do. So if you choose to make that, that choice, and there's a, one of the great things about being an American consumer is that there's tons and tons of choices to make. So if you want to make a choice to have a relationship with me and eat what I produce, there you go. And, and so what, I'm going to t what you need to count on is that I'm doing what I say I'm doing. Is if I tell you I'm doing it a certain way, then that's what I'm doing. And, 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 and I'm not representing myself to be something that I'm not one way or the other. You know, that kind of leads into our next question, and Greg, and I think I'm gonna give you first crack at this, and then we're gonna kind of open the, the floor to the three of you and, and feel free. We'll just let the conversation flow. Don't, don't feel like you have to wait on me to feed you the, uh, the next topic, uh, and then you all can just pass the mic between one another. Uh, and I'll just kind of help guide you here as, as there's a lull. But we've, we've kind of set out that, uh, and Carolyn, I think, uh, has said it, and, and Bill has said it, that producers don't want to be dictated to, they don't, they don't want to be told how to, how to do that. Farmers are notoriously independent. Your industry um, you, you kind of gets a bad rap, I think, because maybe part of the egg bill, that we want to mandate this, and you highlighted it on the screen, that the other livestock groups not happy with UEP and egg farmers for wanting to um, set kind of a federal hen stamp. So how do we balance this, this farmer who's notoriously independent with this understanding that we need to have some kind of standard so we're not all fighting at one another as, as Bill and Carolyn kind of described it? Give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I mean, I love the idea of being free to do whatever I want on my farm. Uh, the reality is, you know, we're, we're not actually all, always so free. We, we answer to customers. You know, our, our company, you know, from the beginning was founded on the idea that we are serving our customers. And customers are confused sometimes. They're very confused. They don't understand our issues. They've got crazy messages coming at them from activists. We serve some very confused people. And, and we have to do that respectfully. So, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. We wish, we wish that all of our consumers were science-based, but, but they're just not. Uh, in, in terms of the egg industry and, and standards, uh, we are such uh, a regulated industry already. You know, I mentioned the food safety. Uh, you know, we have FDA inspectors on our farm, uh, Department of Ag inspectors for environmental. 
you know, obviously OSHA inspectors, uh, we get an organic audit, we have an animal welfare audit, UEP. We, we go from audit to audit to audit. We have a couple people on staff that are basically managing food processing and animal audits, uh, in addition to a few other responsibilities. So, you know what, we are so accustomed to operating this to standards, and our industry is so standardized. We all buy equipment from the same suppliers. We don't really have, you know, when you get into cage-free, then you see a, a lot more variation. There's a thousand ways to build an aviary system. But when you get into the cage-type production, uh, we, we like certainty in our industry. When we don't know what system is going to be legal in five years, we don't want to build anything. And when you have an industry that's not investing and, and building, you have an industry that's dying. So, you know, I feel terrible for the California producers uh, here, you know, that literally for the last uh, four years now, you know, have no idea what the future holds. You know, I've heard employees say things like, you know, when we were having our big fight, uh, I heard a guy say, you know, I'm, I'm sure glad I'm close to retirement because it doesn't look like you guys are going to be around much longer. Mm. You know, that, you know, for a third generation guy, I don't want to be the one. Yeah. I don't want to be the not one. Not on your watch. Not on my clock. We're not going to lose the farm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always easy to get idealistic when it's somebody else's butt on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's your farm and you're shedding the blood in the fight, it's a different perspective. I guess I understand totally where Greg's coming from, but I also know there are 26 states that don't have ballot initiatives. And if I'm a farmer in one of those 26 states, why should I have what Washington and Oregon has put on me? And that's what the problem is right now. We have 24 states that have ballot initiatives, and, and Washington, D.C., but I don't think D.C. has many chance. <laughs> <laughs> And we have 26 states that do not allow ballot initiatives. And those 26 states that do not allow ballot initiatives do not want to have some other states' ballot initiative put upon them. The reason the hog industry has, has rejected it, and I don't know if you've noticed, first of all, what happened to come down to gestation crates? That doesn't even make pigs. That doesn't make bacon. That's the sap. You know? The gestation crate is how you raise the mama, not what's going to the grocery store. But um, when it comes down to gestation crates and hog producers, it's not as integrated a facility, it's not an integrated industry as the chicken industry is. Greg has that chicken from birth till death. He has the egg from the time he has it till the time it goes to the grocery store. In the, in the hog operations, you've got sow producers that have produced sows. You've got people that have sows that raise the baby pigs. Those baby pigs go to a, sometimes go to a grower, sometimes go to a finisher. There may be four owners in there. So if you're the sow producer raising the, and, and you're not allowed to have gestation crates because five owners down the road is selling to, to some company that won't allow gestation crates, that's why the hog industry is fighting, fighting this because they don't want the same type of things put upon them. Um, the cattle industry is the same way. We don't want to be, cattle are raised in 15,000 environments. I'm sure that my cows have a different life than your cows. And I don't want to, how he raises, he's like, he can be on forage year round. I live in Indiana. We have ice for six inches for 60 days. There's no way they can be on forage year round. Um, so we're every, 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 it's a slippery slope, and, and every time we move down that, that line, give HSU is what they want, we're moving further down that line. Qu Follow-up question for you, Carolyn. How, as a cattle producer, or somebody who's been around cattle for a long time, how would you feel uh, about a bovine version of a gestation stall? I, I, a cow-calf guy, I have an intense well, emotional isn't what, feeling isn't about... What, isn't that what dairies are? I mean, have you been to any big dairies lately? The sows, I mean, the cows have, have places they lay down, they get up and turn around and walk out, but they don't have a whole lot of roaming space. I don't know if I'd equate a freestall barn with a gestation stall set up, though. Well, you know, a cow's a lot bigger animal. B Bill, you're, you're, you're a cow-calf guy, Bill. What? Well, it's, it, it's, it's Carolyn hit on two, two things. It's unique to the species, Sorry. and it's also unique to the area, that, the weather pattern that you're in. Right. So what we're marketing lower line is, you know, I mean, I, I'm marketing my story, I'm marketing my my weather pattern, mm -hmm. I, I'm marketing what I can do. Right. I can't do the same thing I do in Indiana or Illinois 
I can't, I, and my story is not the same, uh, you know, five generations ago. And do we do things the same way Grandpa did? Yeah. No. And so the question the consumer is, I, I just went through an intense four days uh, with a large national PR firm for the, 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 the uh, U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance uh, on media training. And they're telling us what the consumer thinks mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. And the consumer, they said, boys and girls, the consumers love farmers and ranchers. Mm -hmm. They don't like farming and ranching. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. That's what they say. That's, I've, I've seen this so research. What's your, what what right. is the answer? So we're sitting there going, what is the answer? The answer is they want to know how you have progressed. It's different. The grandpa did some did stuff. You, you know what? In the beef industry, J.R. Swift, when he was in, in, started up in Chicago, wanted to sell beef, refrigerated beef in New York City. And in 1880, they would, no one would buy it. No one would buy it. They put it on these refrigerated rail cars and sent it to, to beef to New York City, and they wouldn't buy it because they were afraid there was something wrong with it because it had been on the, on the refrigerated car. You know what J.R. Swift did? He said, give it to them. Until they realize that it's not off, that there's nothing wrong with it. So they, he's, he marketed, and, and so what, what we do in animal agriculture today is, is different from what Grandpa did, different one from what Dad did. What Greg is doing is absolutely necessary to, to the survival of, of, of his farm. And, and, and you know what really hurts me a lot is that I've sat on boards with Greg. And, I, and, I, and I've been involved in multiple an, animal agriculture, um, animal welfare uh, committees. And, and he touched in his talk about the fact that some other animal, ag, animal agriculturists didn't get on board with some of this. And, and the tendency, and uh, Karen Bud Fallon is in the back of the room, she's going to speak to you this afternoon. And, and she's extremely aware of public lands issues. And, and, what's going on with, with livestock and public land. But the fact is that if my neighbor is being gored and they're staying away from me, then I'm just going to turn my back and allow my, and not try not to hear the screams of my neighbor. Now I'm telling you that today we must stand with each other, no matter what. We're not man enough, or we're not strong enough to say, all right, I know that I'm not an egg producer, I don't have the same issues, I don't do, but I know where he's coming from, and I must stand in support of him. Then, and our guys are, are and there's plenty of us who would like to just say, look, it's not my fight, I don't want to draw attention to myself. Um, we don't want to stand up to the BLM or the Forest Service or, or, the, or the Water Department or whatever. But we must do that because the future of animal agriculture, in my opinion, in the United States depends on it. Greg, I want to come back to you for a minute because I think uh, you know, Carolyn opened up the question about interstate commerce and uh, the, the states, you know, we could be talking red state, blue state, instead we're talking ballot initiative, non-ballot initiative, and, and so on. Uh, the ag industry is a global industry, uh, so many different segments of it are at least national or regional. Is, is it critically important for ag groups to understand and other and folks in this room to understand that before they can understand why you need a national standard for this issue or that? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is... Uh yeah, I mean, the, the bills that we ran, I mean, if you think about it, they weren't perfect. The legislation that we put together in the Northwest wasn't perfect by any stretch. It, it raises some interstate commerce questions. Uh, we're, we're, re, we're requiring, you know, anyone selling an egg into, this, into the Northwest now to comply to a standard that they may not have where they're producing. Um, that does create problems in an open market. Uh, you know, I'll be straight up there. That, that was one of the problems uh, about what we did. However, how, as a producer, 
are we going to comply? This is what California's faced with. This is why not a single chicken house has been built here in California. How do you invest in something that's going to go out of business? Whenever you're going to be undercut in the market by an out-of-state producer who doesn't have the standard. It, it's, it is a dilemma. If you're looking for a perfect way out of the situation, it doesn't exist. Uh, we've laid in bed and we've thought about it. So, you know, the Northwest, what we did there, uh, you know, we felt like we were doing the right thing in terms of the science. Uh, we assembled the credible people and they agreed with us. Uh, we realized that it had uh, implications uh, that might make others uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we were doing, we believed we were honestly doing the right thing for our consumers. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a dilemma. I, 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 as far as the non-ballot initiative states not wanting uh, a uniform standard, uh, you know, that's not entirely true. I, I realize that a producer in a non-initiative state does see the world differently. They don't have that dark cloud hanging overhead. However, they're selling eggs, you know, in, in states that are affected by this. I don't really see the opposition so much divided, you know, within the egg industry. It's not like the initiative states wanted, non-initiative states don't. It's not like that at all. We have Indiana producers who face no initiative who are, who are big supporters of the egg bill. And that's true across the country because they believe it's the right thing to do. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that simple. And Caroline, see you're itching for the microphone. Do we want a national dog breeder bill? No. no. All right, so let me, so let me. Let, let me just go on one thing. Here's what we're seeing, guys. I know Feld back there has problems because little tiny counties, little tiny parts of counties in cities and townships are outlawing elephants in shows. That's a three county commissioner or three city councilmen make a decision. It then goes to the next level. The county makes a decision, outlaws GMOs or outlaws sugary drinks. And then it goes to the state level and they outlaw something. And then it goes to another state and they outlaw something different. It goes to another state and outlaws something different. This is going to continue and continue and continue until everything we do is regulated. We have dog, how many dog breeder bills are there out there, guys? I mean, yeah, I, and so I'm just going to, we're, we're about out of time. We each have probably one time left. I want to, I want to do one, I want to first of all say, the media is overwhelmingly biased towards producing exciting stories. So the only way you're going to get them in your size, you tell them an exciting story about what you do, okay? Tell them what you do. Tell them how you raise your dogs. Tell them how wonderful they are in the family. Tell them what you do is right. They're not going to cover issues based on facts. They're only going to cover issues based on emotions because facts don't sell newspapers. They don't get people to watch CNN. Go right now. We just finished an election. You guys, I don't care how you believe about Obama or Romney. Obama won this four years ago because he never broke down his grassroots initiatives in all of the states that are mapped. He had people in Ohio for the last four years. He had people in Florida for the last four years, people in Nevada for the last four years. He never stopped. So right now we just had an election. Every one of you in the next week should go by and meet your legislature on both sides of the aisle because believe it or not, they, they flip, you know? Like look at Colorado, Maine just flipped. Um, New Hampshire went from red to blue to red to blue. Um, so go meet them on both sides of the aisle in both chambers and make friends with them now. Make them come to you if they have questions. Make them talk to you if they want to know about an issue. Let them come to you and say, hey, this bill's been introduced. Be the one they want to talk to. Meet your county commissioners. How many of you went to a, to a hearing or a debate for one of your local candidates? Did you ask them how they felt about what your industry is? That's what you have to do. You need to do that now. You need to go meet them now. And before the next election, make sure we have debates on every candidate in every office. But go right now. Meet the people in your city council. Meet the people in your county commissioners. Meet the people with your state legislator. Meet two or three because someone's going to lose their election next time. And be the one they come to. That's the only way to stop this. That's the only way to slow it down. I'm going to, I'm going to give, uh, I guess, the moderator, like maybe my microphone died. <laughs> It's a bad sign when you're, let me borrow that bill. It's a, it's a sign from the heavens that the moderator is. 
So I'm going to use your moderator's prerogative, and I'll just challenge you on two things. Uh, it's something for the audience to think about. Dogs aren't cows or chickens or hogs. Uh, and I know we have a lot of breeders in here, and let me just be very... You said that the wrong way. You said that the wrong way. It's not, it's cows and hogs and cattle aren't dogs yet. Okay, here's, here, here's my challenge to you, because I... I let me give this to you straight, and then I'm going to say one other thing I want to challenge is not... Horses, and companion horses are companion animals in this country, period. Horses are not livestock in this country. And if you think they are, i got a bridge to sell you. Uh, the, the public, the only perception that... Legally, they still are livestock. I know that. But we don't slaughter horses for meat in this country anymore, and there's a reason for that, because consumers view them in this country as companion animals. Okay. Well, the, you know, the two most, the two most emotional uh, animal issues in the, in the United States, two most emotional issues that we have in Oregon are wild horses and wolves. And, and you know, that, that's the, the, the public. But, you know, we, the reality in Oregon is that the state doesn't have enough money to really police what's going on, so they require the they require a vigilante society. So I, uh, because my great great grandfather homestead where I'm, I we are I five goes through the middle of the ranch, and there's a thousand acres on each side of I five, and we are very visible. So I'll I'll tell you just a short anecdote. I got a letter, a certified letter from the State Department of Lands saying cease and desist from taking more than 10 yards of overburden of the out of the headwaters of pasture and and uh, which emanates uh from the ranch and and i had not taken the first shovelful not the first and the reality was that that whoever turned this in to the state department of lands mistook the oregon department of transportation Cleaning the culvert underneath I-5 for me, I'm taking it, and I, but I got copy to every single agency around the certified letter saying that I should cease and desist from doing this practices, and and, and I, I, you know, that tells you what is going on, and and I, I moved a set of cows off of Highway 99, a pasture that bordered 99, because in two days last week. I had one cow calf, and in two days I had four cars stop with cameras and take pictures of 20 cows that were in a short little pasture along the side of the road. And I told my guys, there is no way that we can, should, can possibly afford to expose ourselves to the vigilante society in which we live. Now, now does the state come do this? No. But if they respond, if, if somebody drives by and says, Bill's pastures are too close, to, uh, short, eaten down to the ground next to a creek, the state can send you a letter saying that you are now in violation of Oregon's Clean Water Act. And it's happened. So, so what we have to do is we, we cannot, we have to be proactive about standing up and saying, this is right, this is what we're doing. This is how we have evolved as animal agriculturalists, and, and, and we're, you know, the food, food is high quality, it's safe, and, and, it, and it's the safest, most cheapest food supply in the world. America produces the most abundant, safest, cheapest food supply in the world today. And yet we're trying to, um, to take that down, and it's very sad. Okay. We're going to take a few questions, but I'm, I'm going to finish what I said before the microphone died and, and before the booing and tomato throwing started. I, I think we established earlier this morning we're on the same team, right? Okay, I'm crazy dog person now just like you, right? Okay, so here's my, my challenge to you, and the reason I want to challenge the way you're thinking is because as someone who has studied not only this question, but Prop 2, Issue 2 in Ohio, all the things Greg talked about and, and studied, uh, we haven't even talked about Prop 37 uh, last week, and then more importantly, the election that we just had Tuesday, because I think there are some parallels between the Romney and Obama situation 
Uh, the Romney camp ignored some big warning signs about what consumers, i.e. voters, thought about big issues and it came through to bite them in the tail in a big way. Uh, my admonition to you is not to put your head in the sands and think that all, um, that there is a parallel between dog breeder bills and egg bills like what Greg's talking about or other production related issues. Companion animals and food animals have a lot in common. We have common enemies, we have common values, we have a lot of commonalities. And in the minds of consumers, voters, decision makers, whatever you want to call them, those are different issues. And if you paint them with the same brush, you're going to make mistakes that you won't be able to recover from at some point. Okay, that's my admonition and just to challenge your way of thinking. Yeah, so, I mean, so the way that the egg bill is structured, it's phased in over a long period of time. You know, I've seen estimates that uh, likely only, uh, the most recent estimate I saw was raise egg costs by about two cents a dozen. Um, that's the most recent study that's been done. As a farmer, I gotta tell you, I'm thinking, I hope it's more than that. But uh, <laughs> just because, I mean, we do have a lot of expenses, but it's phased in very slowly over a long period of time. My, my suspicion is that egg farm, U.S. egg farmers are going to remain extremely competitive in, in, a, in a world market. That's, that's what we've been doing forever, and that's what we'll continue to do. I know that there are some concerns about uh, eggs, you know, from Mexico. I, I'm not particularly up on those those discussions, though, as, as far as how that would be avoided. But we're, we're still going to be extremely competitive. Um, uh, we, we don't have the eggs. Uh, I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, Canada already has a quota system in place. They're not particularly competitive in the U.S. on in the egg market. And I just want to say, I mean, each, each livestock group is a bit unique. For example, the, you know, the dairy industry has price supports. Well, theoretically, theoretically speaking, um, you know, if if whatever one industry did if went swept across all the industries, well, then all the livestock groups should have price supports by now because that's been in place for a long time. We have no price supports for eggs in place. Beef does not have price supports, nor does pork. So, to say that you know eggs, because we are a national commodity that needs to travel across state lines, having a federal standard for production necessarily means that you end up with federal dog standards is quite a leap. It's an enormous leap. You're, because the, the commodity Share the pricing, mic. Pass the mic down, Greg. The commodity pricing and the milk pricing, which really doesn't support milk prices right now, you know that it's way below the cost of production, is a government entity. What you're doing is an HSU has pushed, and you can't put the two together. You cannot put the two together. HSU is going to, they have already started when, you and I both know, Greg, when the, egg, when the swine industry refused to support you, who did they go after? Who did HSU go after? Where did all the videos come next? Going after they went after the pork industry because the pork industry fought their initiative. So this is not, you cannot equate commodity pricing structure, which all commodities, most all commodities have now in the, in the grain industry with what HSUS pushes, because what the government pushes that is two totally different categories. HSUS, when they're done with you, will go to the hog industry. When they're done with the hog industry, they will come to the cattle industry. They will, they, you know, they're already there, that's right. And, and to answer your question about meat from a red meat standpoint from Mexico and, and Canada, um, though, what happens within our borders, it, it can be standardized I, I would imagine I mean, regulated, but what happens, in other words, as long as they pass certain health requirements, they can come across the border according to NAFTA. Okay, so how they were raised in Mexico would not be subject to those, as long as they're healthy when they came across the border, and the same in Canada. And so what are, and a lot of our Northwest processors, meat processors, require, really, they require the total numbers to, to, to be able to operate. So getting, getting calves, or getting cow, slaughter cows, for instance, from Canada is essential to some of uh, the, the Pacific Northwest beef processors so that they can stay in business. And, and the Midwest Texas and, and Kansas feedlots stay full 
because calves come from northern from northern Mexico across the Mexican border and are fed in the United States. Now the question is from we, we did a country of origin labeling. So if you if you have a calf born in Mexico, raised for six months in Mexico and then trans to Texas, comes across the border to Texas and is fed in Texas and slaughtered in Kansas. And and the meat is produced what is the country of origin label for that? It, is it a product of Mexico? Is it a product of the United States? It, 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 you know, it's a, and, and so we have a, a, a dual situation there. But what worries me a great deal is that the, the reach of, of, of where we're going with, with all of this is to say, look, we need to have a minimum standard, okay? So that we can say, all right, if you need to go above the standard, that's fine. Do whatever you whatever works for your situation, and if you want to go to a minimum standard, it needs to be such that it can be lived with. You, you know, we can't regulate ourselves out of business. No, the, the the flip side about the country of origin labeling is in kind of a, a state of limbo now because the World Trade Organization has said that's not that's you can't do country of origin labeling uh, under international trade. Through. So what's going to happen there? We don't we don't know yet how the how the U.S. will respond, uh, but. Bill or and or Greg or, or Carol, maybe we can take this though. I guess my question though, related back to the young lady's question about imported food, you you've kind of laid out, yes, Canada or Mexico, they, they're going to do whatever that we can't control how they produce there. But don't do you think, uh, and think about all the companies on the slide that have said no gestation stalls. If a company adopts uh, a belief that let's say we need to purchase eggs from producers who meet this particular standard. They're, they're not necessarily going to import mag eggs from Mexico or Canada because they're a few cents a dozen cheaper. Is that, w would you think that's a, a logical follow-up to that question? I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer that. Yeah, so, you know, ideally, you know, our retailers would come to us and they would say, well, I'm an egg if, uh, if you'd like to retain our business. Uh, these are our standards. Uh, that has not happened at all. None, none of the retailers are willing to put themselves out there and endorse any particular standard in such a contentious environment. They're, they're looking, literally, they're looking to United Egg Producers, who has a very credible science-based animal welfare background, and they're looking to us to work this thing out. And they are waiting for that to happen. Uh, we're doing everything we can. To, to work this out and make it a workable situation nationally. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're the ones in the tough spot. None of the retailers are not putting themselves out there. Uh, it's just too risky for them. Uh, they would have rather us take the risks. And in the, in the beef industry, you know, for, from a producer of beef in Oregon, we have no major processing facilities in Oregon. All of the major beef processing facilities are out of Oregon. So if I'm an Oregon consumer and I want to eat a, eat a steak that is born, raised, processed in Oregon, I have to go to a small market. I, I have to go to a, what I consider to be a niche market. I, my beef is, is raised, fed, and processed and sold in Oregon. But we ship out of state to, to Seattle. But and the same is true with lamb. The large, the, there are only two large lamb processors in, in the western United States, and that's one in, in Colorado and one in California. And, and, and so we've all said, we make, the beef industry makes claims today that says that, that in, we have the same number of cows in the United States today that we had in 1956. And we are producing twice as many pounds of beef with that with that many cows with 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 fewer cows than we've had since since the 50s well what does that say that says we're we're doing a better job in, in a footprint of make of what that those cows footprint on the land and we're much better in in terms of production so we we our genetics are better uh, our technology is better uh, you know the, the health of the beef industry is is i think is pretty reasonable today but but we're looking at our input costs are so high. I mean, diesel four dollars a gallon, and everybody, you know, we we have tremendous amount of uh, of pressure from the other side. So 
I, I think you have to look in the consumer and the retailer my, has to understand what the whole process is and how many options they have. You, you can't eat a steak in Oregon in the generic market that is processed in Oregon because it just doesn't happen. Okay, I want to get some more questions. Yes, ma'am, right in the front row. Um, I got a question and a comment in listening to you, and I grew up out in the farm country in Colorado, so I understand it. I respect farmers and ranchers very much, and I know what you guys are going through. In listening to your comments, um, I have a concern that you're not taking HSUS as seriously as you should as far as what they're going to require from you. The dog community's been putting up with this and watching HSUS and fighting them for over 20 years now. We have a lot of experience with them. If you think they're going to stop at what you think are proper cage sizes and not require any more from you, you need to see what we're seeing. We have cages that we take our dogs to the dog shows in. They consider that cruel because that dog is in a cage. The dog's happy, the dog's safe. You need to take HSUS seriously that they are not going to stop at what you think is proper and what science says is proper. They're going to push you to the point where you aren't going to be able to produce those chicken or those cattle or those pigs for us to eat. If they get their way, you've got to take a stand at your science and not say, oh, well, we'll compromise with them and, and we'll accept what they say. Um, your question. The, Can I respond? I, yeah, yeah, please I, do because I, I think. I have a question of tell me otherwise because I'm, I work with, you know, the cattle people and I try and get a coalition going in Colorado so that we can work together. And I've got real concerns in hearing you speak if you really understand the depth of the danger in HSUS and what you're doing. Right, so just, I mean, just keep this in mind. You're, you're talking to the guy that hung up on Wayne Buscelli when he offered to drop a ballot initiative if we would just make a concession in our legislation. So, you know, I'm back at I, I was polite though, I didn't really hang up on this. <laughs> I am polite by nature. Just, I want to make a point there. I am actually a polite person by nature, and I remain so even when in, you know, talking with people that I disagree with, people that I don't have any respect for, people that maybe don't deserve it, I still treat them respectfully, just because that's the way I am. So, uh, as far as um, will they ever stop, we are not even considering the idea that they're happy with what this agreement is. I mean, they wanted cage-free production. Clearly, they, they want a vegan society, and they're not going to be content until they get, until they get there, and they're not going to get there. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, they're, they're probably 15 years ahead in the European Union, and the Europeans are still laughing at HSUS and the idea of becoming a vegan society. People, I, I just simply do not see it happening. I understand the fear. I, I've stood in front of the freight train. I, I know what that looks like. However, I just don't see people giving up. I mean, what we eat is such a huge part of our culture. There's, there's a percentage, of course, that they always sway. That's, that's the way it is in anything. And I think what I want to... I, and I, I, I will, just one quick comment. I, I'm... I, I hear what you're saying. I'm absolutely uh, understand the seriousness of, of the issue, and, and I and I, I know what they're capable of. And I've seen there was a, a case that I I almost don't know if I should even mention it, but the Oregon Humane Society um, seized a herd of cows just recently, and um, we fought them like crazy because and it didn't work. They they had the, uh, they had, they were, uh, the, accompl their accomplices was the Department of Agriculture and, and um, these are food animals and if you don't think someone is treating them the way they should be treated, there is, uh, there is remedies for that within the, the food chain and, or within the food animal process. And these cattle were sold and they, they stopped the sale and seized the cattle. And they wanted to know from me at the time, 
how, who could they hire that would handle them and what were the ramifications of the seizure? And they had no idea what they were getting themselves in for. And, and I mean, so, and the fact is I saw the pictures later on of these cows and they really were not as emaciated as they might have sounded like they were. Uh, okay. Two quotes from William Vassell you all need to remember. The one he first, when he first started the industry, we have no ethical obligation to preserve the different breeds of livestock produced through selective breeding. One generation and out. We have no problems with the extinction of domestic animals. They are creations of human selective breeding. That's Wayne Pacelli. That's what he said. That's a quote. There's no question. The second one is, and remember this one because it might be even more serious, we would be foolish and silly not to unite with people in the public health sector, food safety, the environmental community, and unions to try and challenge corporate agriculture. I will say three good news things, and work with your legislators. When the dog breeder bill came up, we worked with legislators to work with you to get, if they had to pass something, because the press was so hot and heavy on them, to work with you to pass something that you could live with. And I hope in your state, if you got one passed, they worked with you. I'm sorry if they didn't. The second one is, well, that, in some states you can. That's The other advantage is to keep a split house and Senate, like we have in Washington. If you have one chamber in one party and one chamber in the other party, a lot less gets passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost that. Yeah, I know you did. Colorado did too. Um, the other bill we, we started a long time ago, and we've gotten through about 20 states now, is the Animal Ag Boards. I don't know how many of your, of your states have them, but those are the boards where there is a huge group of people that oversees and start to set the, the requirements for animal production. The one we're working on now is the Ag Protection Bill, that if you take a video that you say is, shows animal abuse, it has to be turned over to officials. That means the law enforcement society before you can take it to the television people. And it has to be the original that goes to them. That's passed in four states. I know it's already coming up, already been submitted in Wyoming and Pennsylvania for next year. But that may be something else you want to push in your state because these videos you can't even prove they're at your farm. So, well, that, and, you know, a dog, dog. I, I have border collie dogs, and we we work our, our sheep and cattle with them, and and uh, you know they're absolutely invaluable tools. And and without them, you know, my good dog, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't trade her for all the money in the world. And and I and they, it'd take me three or four guys to replace her. But, but in eastern Oregon, where they're on the breaks of the Salmon River, um, and the wolves have come, protected by the state, and Temple Grandin is coming to speak tomorrow, and she could speak to this issue, you can't use your dogs anymore on your cows because they become canine averse because of the interaction with the wolf. And I mean, it, it, and it's, you should see the evidence of what happens in that situation, and yet everybody is tickled to death that the wolves are there. So, I mean, there's so many issues. There's a question in the back. Well, we're actually, we, I'd, I'd love to take your question, but we're literally out of time. And what I want to do, For Bill. For my part, thank you very much. Oh, I want to hand, hand, that, hand that microphone down this way, actually, because we're going to need it here at the podium. Uh, yeah, thank you to all three of our panelists. As uh, Patty comes up to take back over and introduce the next session, panelists, you're, you're excused. I just want to close by saying this. As you, you've been around the day. I want to close by saying this, it's, it's obvious that we have some very big issues and it's obvious that we don't all agree all the time on all the big issues. I think the thing that's important to remember is that we're all experts when it comes to our own issues and it's very easy and very tempting to listen to something that Greg says that you don't like or agree with or something that Carolyn says that maybe doesn't sound quite right and to automatically apply it through your own lens of expertise. I, I think all three of those folks are experts in their particular area of animals and, and we really do ourselves a, a service by listening to them and kind of learning from their experience. You guys have been really great.